Nigeria has the potential to become a major player in the global economy through its human and natural resources and, of course, other endowments. However, the country is faced with major challenges ranging from unemployment to insecurity, poor infrastructure and manufacturing sector. Also, that's just a few. The outcome and, of course, the outlook remains fragile given Nigeria's high population growth rates and declining GDP per capita. A policy advisory council that was set up when President Bola Ahmed Tinubu was elected has offered several recommendations on how the Tinubu administration can put Africa's largest economy back on track. Overall, the plan is to grow the Nigerian economy at a GDP average growth rate of 7% per annum to achieve a $1 trillion GDP in the next eight years. Gospel Obele, Chief Economist for Streetnomics, joins me now to take a look at some of the recommendations in that policy document. Gospel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Tolu. Good morning. Good morning. So I think it's important for us to have a, an idea of where Nigeria is currently with uh, the situation, the economic situation, before we look at where the Tinubu administration wants to take us. So in terms of the country that President Tinubu took over on May 29th, give us some of the economic indices that we use to be able to track any potential progress we make in the next few months or the next few years. Yes, thank you very much. Um, headline indices are indicating that um, the Nigerian economy is really, really on the verge of so many um, deep concerns, you know, for investors, the people, households, you know, and all. GDP is currently at um, almost at, on, on the brink of 3%, and uh, it also hasn't reflected in the real genuine sense of what recovery should look like for the average Nigerian. I, I said that because there's so much concentration on growth, a lot of efforts have also gone into growth, but we haven't still, still seen, you know, that yield result over time. You also have context of youth unemployment, and overall unemployment at 33%, underemployment rising, you know, um, external um, inflation currently at 24%, uh, 22%, with food inflation as high as 24%. Um, you have external reserves and the current Naira situation, and all of these indices showing clearly that there are deep cost of living crisis, deep um, cost of um, doing business. There are huge threats to markets development and the potential for markets to also grow and provide more opportunities to, for SMEs to scale, you know. And there's just a lot of perception of um, um, distrust and low confidence in the system. So uh, in a nutshell, those are just the headline indicators in terms of what's happening right now and how inconsistency of policies and fiscal indiscipline to a very large extent, you know, at the beck and call of um, a lack of gross lack of political will or institutional will to drive that inclusive approach towards policy design, growth, prosperity and development. So. Uh, the big ticket will be what is the current administration thinking of in terms of how um, it wants to approach the situation or the different context of challenges that we're we dealing with. And um, if really it has a political will to stay execution, you know, in the course that we want it to go to, so we, it will yield the kind of results we want it to. All right, so let's look at the fact that we've seen some movements and some announcements in the past few weeks uh, since President yeah. Tinubu was inaugurated. So he enforced the end of the fuel subsidy regime, suspended the central bank governor, Godwin Mifiele, has also suspended the FCC chairman, the floating of the Naira, and now the CBN's decision to lift cash deposit restrictions on domiciliary accounts that was announced last night. Then add to it, of course, that he had a policy advisory council that has some very strong recommendations on what needs to be done uh, for, of course, the Nigerian economy. In terms of the first few steps we've seen economically from this administration, what do you think these first few weeks are telling us? I think the first few weeks are to sort of build confidence back in the system, particularly also build confidence in the Tinimba administration. You know, it goes two ways, you know. So, um, and that's what um, the president is currently trying to do, just to build confidence, you know. All of those decisiveness in terms of execution order, suspension, going on new policies, establishing a um, um, little bit of essays and PACs here and there, are just a sign for, to help the investor community and even Nigerians and domestic investors community build confidence in that government. And um, which is safe to say as well, because I mean, recent times we've not, one of the major factors that has also affected that co the confidence in the Nigerian economy and in the investment market, as it were, has been the indecisiveness of, um, of, of, of past administration. So um, this is sort of like trying to build, a, a, create a perception of a new order. And I use the word perception because it's just the first two weeks, you know, so we're yet to see a whole lot more. And we are hoping to see some more alignment, not just in 
in the decisions being made, but also in the mechanism around those decisions, how those decisions will be used for the theory of change that, that we want to see, you know, in context. And, and particularly also, how much of will, you know, to what extent will this particular will take us to? So it's not just enough to build confidence in to what extent are the current actions and policies and all that going to be driven to ensure that the core structural institutional fundamentals are in place to fix the most critical productivity issues in Nigeria. So it's safe to say that the very best this builds confidence. But again, that confidence is still hanging on the fence because uh, stakeholders are still waiting to see how it all lines up, how it all aligns, how it all deals with the key structural issues, and if the government really, really had their, have their hearts in the ring for a long time or for the long haul. All right, so the council set some targets, but then at the end of the day, the overarching goal is that the economy should grow at a GDP average growth rate of 7% per annum to achieve a $1 trillion uh, GDP in the next eight years. We have a current growth rate of about 2.31% for the first quarter of this year, year on year. But as you said, touching 3%, some have said uh, for 2022, we're looking at around 3.5% in annual change. In May, the National Bureau of Statistics showed that the aggregate GDP stood at 51.2 trillion naira. In terms of ambitious goals, if we can get the targets uh, that the council has set, in terms of ambitious goals, is this too ambitious, not enough, or right on the mark? Because we've had these conversations about how our GDP growth rates is just running almost parallel with Nigeria's population growth rates, not allowing us to be able to have enough for our growing population. I mean, in terms of the projections, um, it's fair, and I used to was fair because we we reached this point towards the the brink of the Adwoa administration going into the, the Jonathan administration. You know, Nigeria was conveniently doing from within the range of a 5.5 to 7 percent, conveniently. You know, and that was just before the 2016 recession. And since the 2016 recession, we have not even hit 5 percent conveniently again, or you know, and all that. So. Uh, but what, what we see, what we saw at the time was that growth was also associated or largely unhealthy or unproductive um, because you had growth, you know, going pari passu with increased inflationary dynamics. And in recent times, move from just inflationary dynamics to a deep cost of living crisis. So uh, in as much as I clamor for growth, because growth shows to us that uh, economic activities are booming or on the rise. Uh, the, the trick about activities also can mean that we are not growing productively. I don't know if you get trying to say so. Mm -hmm. um, that, that an individual is, is involved in lots of activities doesn't necessarily mean that that individual is productive. So we, can, we should be careful of um, not becoming a nation that has um, got so drunk in activities that we don't have the productivity. And we've been there before a couple of times. So productivity would therefore mean that the growth is associated with more jobs, with a core industrialized market, with expanded market. Because what we term as revolution right now in the Nigerian market is very related. It's because our market are less regulated, less competitive, you know, and less expansive. And it's too concentrated on critical segments like Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt. You know, you need a lot more representation of market activity and even market productivity and all that across, preferably across one third of Nigeria, you know, than we be, before we begin to talk about half you know, the 36 states or into all of the 36 states. So it's for me more around not getting drunk into the growth conversation, but looking at growth from the lens of the need to drive more productivity. In fact, if we focus on productivity, we will naturally achieve growth. Mm -hmm. All right, but if we focus on growth, the, the chances of losing sight of productivity is going to be very high. And, and what's going to happen is we're going to be faced with a political narrative of increased growth prospects, you know, at the mercy of you know, a worsening cost of living um, uh, crisis that is sort of we, we, um, 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 how like trapping down Nigerians into a new vicious circle, you know, of poverty in context. So we need everything to go hand in hand as much as possible, which is again the pro uh, a, a complex trade off to deal um, in context to the current realities right now. Very true. So let's look at one of the sectors that's quite pivotal for any growth, and that's, of course, the oil and gas uh, sector. So the Energy and Natural mm. Resources uh, Committees of the Advisory Council are also recommending that the Tinubu administration consolidates regulatory agencies in the oil and gas sector by merging the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority, and the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board 
under a single regulator. And this makes us think of the RSIR reports, of course. There's also the proposed sale of the major stakes of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited in the upstream, midstream, and downstream sectors of the oil and gas industry, which could earn the government, they say, about $17 billion. When you look at these proposals and how opaque and very um, lacking in transparency Nigeria's oil and gas industry has been, it also comes with proposals about addressing the insecurity in the Niger Delta to increase uh, the uh, crude oil production per barrel per day, and of course moving that forward at least by 2024. What do we look at when we look at these proposals? How much further will it get Nigeria in all of this? Well, first of all, is the fact that I'm happy to see that um, the new administration is sort of um, embracing long existing ideas or reforms like the Oran report and that's a very good one um and, and it's also a, a sign to show that there's some form of willingness on the table which again speaks to the fact that you know the, the goal has been to gain confidence in the last two weeks and um, this is also very good because trying to also harness the regulated potential of the oil and gas sector is a very good way to maximize you know returns from the sector to start with you know and, and that's also critical because it's all it has been a sector that has been designed you know to to feed vested interest or self-interest over a period of years right now and you know try and, and those regulatory gaps are sort of intentional over time by extractive institutions you know to empower their interest and control you know and, and technically that would mean that when you begin to close those regulatory leakages you are seeking to relax the control from the vested stakeholders or you know stakeholders who have vested interest in the game so and and, and it's pretty much interesting and very very uh, encouraging to see that the, that the decisiveness of the of the tenable led administration has also extended to that stage and we're hoping to see that it to be properly executed however in context to execution right now uh, we're hoping to also see that we're shifting away from the problem and trying to create more opportunities all right so you want to fix the security challenge in the in the um, in the niger delta that security challenge has been there for almost forever you know no government has been able to successfully fix that challenge to the end you know and it is not necessarily in fixing all of that challenge that will get to empower or unlock the potential of the sector but rather it's in expanding new frontiers for opportunities so for instance fixing the refinery so as we can also scale local production you know, and finding a win-win, you know, with illegal refineries and the likes, you know, because illegal refineries are also producing and selling to legal um, institutions, all right? So how do you create the win-win interest point, you know, to ensure that you're creating more opportunities, you're expanding the markets, rather than being focused and lost in um, fixing the challenges and racing past something that you know you may not be able to entirely you know, um, overcome whilst mm. being in office. So I, I want to think of it from a new angle, you know, rather than questioning poverty, questioning lack, questioning insecurity or challenges, create more opportunities, create pathways for, to, for prosperity, create, create pathways for more local production. Again, which I've not seen in terms of reflections and linkage to the whole subsidy removal argument. You've re removed subsidy. What is your plan? to scale local production. Your plan cannot be Dangote. Your plan has to be beyond Dangote. And your plan cannot be fixing insecurities in Niger Delta. It has to be beyond that. You know, and a third level of this conversation will be, you know, the oil and gas sector as strong and as big as its potential still holds just less than 7% you know, of economic activity. Again, not yet economic productivity, but economic activity. So the big ticket question is, how can we reinforce and empower 93% of the economy that is non-oil? You know, and begin to find low-hanging fruits. One of the quick low-hanging fruits will be empowering lots of SMEs who are ready to export and crashing up all of the process and bottlenecks to facilitate access to market on a stop shop, you know, and all that. So by the time you begin to think of that, you're expanding opportunities again. You're making the bulk, over the 90% bulk of your economy who are ready, waiting, and willing, you know, and, and, and all of that. And you also want to talk about the service sector. That, that, she, that holds about 53% of the economy. Nigeria right now doesn't have a service sector plan. All right, so I actually expected to see more of that in the PSC report because that sector is really critical to unlocking the growth, the potential, the creative expression of young people, you know, and, and that growing remote freelancing market as the case may be. So what, what I'm trying to say is that there is need, the, the questions around development, productivity, inclusion are shifting away from how do we fix the problem so how do we scale the opportunities that we have available? And once we begin to focus on that, on the positive, we can un unlock growth faster. Sorry, we can unlock productivity faster. Mm -hmm. We automatically would mean that you're unlocking growth by default, 
and then you know you're, you're you're raising growth prospects with also high employment levels you're reducing inflation and all that so the prospect, prospects are more when you shift the body language and the attention to more opportunities than trying to fire fights all over the place and uh, um yeah so that that's what i think about it so it has okay. to be a balanced and a healthy approach thinking about the way forward and interestingly enough, the uh, PAC has also actually proposed formalizing and legitimizing illegal refineries. Uh, some have yeah. said this is just legalizing legality, but in a situation where we find ourselves, Nigeria may need to think out of the box uh, regarding these situations. And interestingly enough, you mentioned the creative sectors, and I will be having a yeah. conversation next about, of course, the economics of Africa's creative industry. So we're on the same page today, Gospel. So let me take you to the capital markets, and I need to talk about palliatives because of time. But there is, of course, an interesting proposal there as well. So the the Policy Advisory Council has uh, taken a look at the capital markets, which have, of course, given the president some favorable responses in terms of his actions in the past few weeks. Now, the council laid out a plan to accelerate implementation of the Nigerian Capital Market Master Plan. So part of this plan includes issuing long-term, high-yielding debt securities for dedicated specific projects and initiatives, also facilitating increased participation of pension funds and insurance companies in the capital markets, collaborating with fintech companies to introduce new capital market products such as multi-issue structural uh, structured products, special financial bonds to facilitate the interests of SMEs, and more. In terms of giving the capital market the right positioning and the right role for the progress of Nigeria's economic uh, situation. Wh what do you think about this? I mean, I agree so much with the thinking around it because the Nigerian capital market has really grown and grown to become very influential in Africa. So that already positions us in terms of building lots of investors' confidence and taking our narrative you know, into the regional and global market. So it makes sense. Again, in the context of what, how it's designed, you can see lots of collaboration, lots of uh, access to market by, uh, for fintechs and other um, uh, creative stakeholders in that space. You know? So um, the conversation will be building around sustainability and, and ensuring that all of the dynamics of the cap capital market strongly tie up to reinforcing the productivity core in the real sector. All right, so that's also very critical so that you can have a capital market that is reinforcing the growth of a real sector and also have, because at the end of the day, fintechs can't do anything without their consumers. All right, so you want to think of the entirety of the value chain and that collaborative effort that you're bringing to the table. Um, also, let's not forget that the recent global interest rate hike spree and the cost of living crisis has also created a divergence between the financial market and the real sector all right and it's it's the reason why we use the term cost of living crisis is not because there is no recession it's because the interest rates and co has benefited or has um, yeah benefited the financial sector at the expense of the real sector so that drag over time you know sort of looking for what the balance is and to make sense to use this policy to more or less align on that level of compromise and interest. Again, it can be a positive, 100% positive alignment. All right, so but this is a good step in the right direction and we're looking out for more. All right, so Gospel, before I let you go, we have to situate this in the real economy, situate this in the real situation uh, that millions of Nigerians are facing. We know that, unfortunately, under the Buhari administration, millions more Nigerians uh, crossed into the poverty line. But with the removal of subsidy, we've seen a rise in the cost of living. And so this comes with the removal of fuel subsidy and now news of an expectation that in the coming weeks there will be an increase in electricity prices that will yeah. put more pressure on households, incomes, and even small and medium businesses. And also an expectation of more taxes as the Finance Act 2023, with its amendments, come into full implementation. So how do we make this easier for the millions of middle class, lower income, for just generality, the millions of Nigerians right now? There's still the $800 million loan from the World Bank, which they yeah. said it'd be up to this administration. But there's conversations around the conditional tra uh, cash transfer. How do you get it to the poorest, to the, those who need it the most? Labor is now threatening again to go back on strike because of this subsidy matter. At the end of the day, how do we cushion the hard decisions that must be taken in the time that they are taken? First of all, it would be for us to pace the hard decisions. They must be taken. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But we need to pace it enough and ensure that we have the necessary social, intelligent social interventions in place you know, to cushion the impact from these policy decisions. Otherwise, you're going to run the nation into chaos. And um, secondly, would be the fact that lots and lots of trade unions like the NLC and Co. need to wake up and go past 
threatening strikes and all those things. Those things, yeah, it happens everywhere in the world, but it's like gradually become less effective right now in Nigeria. You know, labor unions have to become, have to advocate and find themselves a seat on the table to, you know, use evidence to pitch their position clearly, respectfully, and, you know, using the diplomatic tactics, even lobbying to ensure that you probably either drag a policy further or look for other ways to introduce the social interventions earlier before the policies go 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 out announced or the policy action is being taken. So the dynamics around influencing government, pacing policies and all that, despite the fact that these are hard decisions that need to be taken, needs to be done more intelligently. And it needs to be done from the context of the ensuring the social intervention are actually right for the people. So all of these conditional cash transfers and all that are just a waste of time and and your situation where you, you're creating leakages again with the ecosystem within the ecosystem of social interventions and those leakages are not yielding any positive relief impact for people so there has to be a much more organized approach to influencing to lobbying to pacing policies and ensuring that the average nigerian feels that the government is thinking you know thinking about them thinking for them and putting them in the larger picture of things and, and right now it doesn't seem so uh, in as much as i understand that there's a need to quote unquote hit the ground running uh, but but lots need to still be done more intelligently and um, um, well paced um, to get the results we are looking for. Again, you know, one situation where you have policy inconsistency or some form of incoherent uh, um, execution or rollout of these policies. You know, one policy should enable the next, should enable, enable the next, and facilitate you know the cross exchange of uh, how those policies are, are are all going together towards yielding the same objective at the end of the year. And that objective is economic growth and prosperity for the Nigerian people. Gospel Abele, it's always a pleasure. I know we have conversations. We're waiting more to see uh, the president's economic team, who may replace the CBN governor, who may become minister of finance. So there are conversations we'll be having in the coming weeks, and we look forward to touching base with you.